on World News Tonight. Dramatic twist. Pakistan's former Premier Nawaz Sharif walks a free man following a gracious granting of bail. Pleaded guilty. Ex-Trump Attorney General is pleads guilty in a Georgia election interference case. Thwarted again. Israel succeeds in defending against yet another Hamas excursion, this time by sea. And La Catrina. Mexico City's streets come alive as hundreds of skeletons paraded on the capital's main boulevard. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you're joining us on World News this Wednesday night. Tonight we begin with updates on the return of Nawaz Sharif. The Pakistani court has granted bail to three-time former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif in two corruption cases. Former Pakistan Prime Minister who returned to the country last weekend was granted bail in the Tokushana case by the Islamabad Accountability Court today. Pakistan's Punjab provincial government suspended Nawaz Sharif's seven-year sentence in the al Azizia's case, while two separate courts confirmed his bail in three different corruption cases. This marked a major legal relief to the former premier after his return from London following four years of self-exile. For the first time since his return on October 21st, the 73-year-old three-time former prime minister and supremo of Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz, appeared before an Islamabad account Court. Sharif marked his ascendance in the accountability court of Judge Muhammad Bashir, who had suspended his arrest orders in the Toshakhana case last week to facilitate his return to Pakistan. The attendance was significant to show that he had surrendered before the court. He was allowed to leave after the judge witnessed his presence in the courtroom. During the hearing, the National Accountability Bureau prosecutor contended that Sharif had surrendered and therefore his arrest warrants should be cancelled. The judge subsequently confirmed Sharif's bail in the case against surety bonds of rupees 1 million. The hearing of the case was adjourned till November 20th. The case is based on allegations that Sharif, former President Asif al Zardari, and former Prime Minister Yusuf Raza Jilani received luxury vehicles and gifts from Toshkana. Sharif was convicted in the Al Azizia steel mills corruption case and sentenced to seven years in jail in December 2018. Delivering the verdict, the judge had said that there was concrete evidence against the former Premier in the Al Azizia case and that he was unable to give the trail of the money used to set up by the Al Aziza steel mills in Saudi Arabia by his family in 2001. Meanwhile, the Islamabad High Court extended Sharif's protective bail in Avonfield and Al Aziza corruption cases till October 26 after the NAB said it had no objections to the plea filed by the deposed Prime Minister, who wants to clear his name to contest the general elections expected in January. Sharif was disqualified in 2017 and later in 2018 convicted in the two cases of corruption. He has always denied allegations of any wrongdoing and termed his conviction orchestrated by the powerful establishment in collusion with the judiciary. And now updates on the Israel-Hamas war. Israel says it killed Hamas divers who were trying to infiltrate Israel from the Gaza Strip via the sea. Meanwhile, the U.S. once again clarified that it does not want any conflict with Iran. According to Israeli media outlets, a number of Hamas divers were killed on Tuesday when they tried to infiltrate Israel from Gaza via the sea. Israel Defense Forces say at least six divers were killed, although the exact number has not been confirmed. Reports say Israel's Navy forces spotted the group entering the sea from a tunnel and opened fire at the divers, killing them. Meanwhile, the UN agency responsible for Palestinian refugees warned it cannot continue to bring in more humanitarian aid into Gaza without more fuel being supplied. The United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in Near East said Tuesday that if more fuel isn't delivered to the war-torn region, it will be forced to halt humanitarian operations by Wednesday night. Israeli Daily Herets reported on Tuesday that negotiations for the release of a large number of hostages are underway after Hamas released two elderly Israelis earlier this week and two Americans last week. According to sources familiar with the negotiations, Qatar, Egypt and other countries are negotiating with Hamas over the release of multiple hostages. 
The Daily says Hamas could ask for a number of things in exchange, such as more humanitarian aid, including fuel. And the White House also on Tuesday warned against a full ceasefire in Gaza, saying it would only benefit Hamas, but humanitarian pauses in the region should be considered to let aid in. U.S. President Joe Biden said the day before that talk about any ceasefire could start only once all of the more than 200 hostages taken by Hamas were released. And with concerns that Iran could get involved in the armed conflict, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken told the U.N. that while Washington does not seek any conflict with Tehran, it would act swiftly and decisively if Iran or its proxies attack U.S. personnel anywhere. The United States does not seek conflict with Iran. We do not want this war to widen. But if Iran or its proxies attack U.S. personnel anywhere, make no mistake, we will defend our people, we will defend our security swiftly and decisively. The comments came as Blinken spoke to the 15-member U.N. Security Council amid international fears the conflict could spill over into a wider war and draw in other militant groups like Hezbollah. And after 18 days of agony for their families, two Israeli hostages have been released. More than 200 others remain missing, including the women's husbands, who were all abducted during a Hamas attack. Slow steps towards safety. Two Israeli hostages close to freedom after more than a fortnight held captive by Hamas. This video, released by the militants, shows 85-year-old Yoshevid Lifshitz and 79-year-old Nurit Cooper. It's unsettling footage. Masked men take the women with one hand, their weapons with the other, and deliver the hostages, now survivors, into the arms of the Red Cross. It's OK, let's go. It's OK? Let's go. Yes. You go with Islam? Shalom. Shalom, Yoshevid says, the Hebrew word for peace. Abducted from their homes in kibbutz near Oz on October 7, today Yoshevid and Nurit were transported through Gaza's Rafa crossing to Egypt for medical care. Hamas claims the elderly women were released on humanitarian grounds due to their poor health. Medical staff confirming they were OK, leaving them to rest and reunite with their families. We are thrilled, Yoshevid's grandson says. We're expecting the rest to be released. Both the women's husbands remain inside Gaza among 200 other captives. Over in the U.S. now, former Trump attorney Jenna Ellis has pleaded guilty to a felony for helping fuel lies about thousands of dead people casting votes in the 2020 presidential election. She is now the fourth court defendant to flip in the Georgia election interference case against former President Trump and more than a dozen others. For weeks, attorney Jenna Ellis fiercely defended then-President Trump as he falsely claimed the 2020 election was rigged. Today, she sobbed as she told the judge she was wrong. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. Ellis in a Georgia courtroom pleading guilty to a felony for helping fuel lies about thousands of dead people casting votes in 2020. I failed to do my due diligence. Smiling for her mugshot just two months ago, now the fourth co-defendant to flip in Fulton County's sprawling election interference case against the former president and more than a dozen others. Mr. Trump has pleaded not guilty, arguing he's being targeted by Democratic prosecutors because he's the Republican frontrunner. He was back in a Manhattan courtroom today, facing the state's star witness, his former fixer turned foe, Michael Cohen. This is about accountability, plain and simple. Raise your right hand. It was Cohen's congressional testimony that jump-started the New York case, where his former boss now stands to lose his namesake company, accused of exaggerating the value of his assets to receive better loan terms in a $250 million civil fraud suit. It was my experience that Mr. Trump inflated his total assets when it served his purposes. Today, Cohen said he was tasked by the former president with boosting Mr. Trump's total assets to achieve a number he arbitrarily elected. While Mr. Trump's legal team has argued real estate values are subjective. Outside of court, Mr. Trump took aim at Cohen's credibility, pointing to Cohen's guilty plea for tax fraud and lying to Congress. Well, he's a liar, as you know, a felon. So he's a liar trying to get a 
better deal for himself, but uh, it's not going to work. We did nothing wrong, and that's been proven. Moving on to the road to the White House now. GOP presidential hopefuls are responding to the war in Israel. They also talk about how foreign affairs could impact the 2024 race. It's been several months since the Republican presidential race kicked off and Donald Trump remains far and away the top of the pack. But it's the infusion of foreign affairs that's taking the 2024 race into an entirely new phase. So just how will the Israel-Hamas war weigh on the minds of voters? The candidates aren't waiting to find out as they use the major issue playing out overseas to draw a line for their own campaigns. As war rages in the Middle East, a war of words is erupting between Republican presidential hopefuls flexing their foreign policy agendas in the wake of the Israel-Hamas conflict. All have staunchly defended Israel, but each fighting to pose themselves as the best alternative to GOP frontrunner Donald Trump. Florida Governor Ron DeSantos said welcoming any Gazan refugees is unacceptable. Acceptable. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley agreeing that the U.S. should not take in Gaza refugees, but pushing back on DeSantis' comments on Hamas's views on Israel's right to existence, touting her own foreign policy experience as Trump ambassador to the United Nations. Still, there is one thing the candidates agree on slamming Trump when he called Hezbollah, the Lebanese military group, quote, very smart. They were comments Trump would later walk back, but not before facing bipartisan criticism. The Israel-Hamas war has revealed deep fault lines among Republican presidential hopefuls over whether America should isolate or intervene in foreign affairs. Entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy in the past said the U.S. could phase out aid for Israel, but now he is focusing on Israel having a clear objective for a ground invasion in Gaza, while former Vice President Mike Pence stresses the need for American boots on the ground to show a united front with allies. Even as Senator Tim Scott is using the opportunity to go after the president, doubling down on his stance that it's Joe Biden who has blood on his hands for the war breaking out. The 2024 hopefuls are resolute in their support for Israel and also on pro-Palestinian protests arising on college campuses, many calling to revoke those student visas and deport them. It remains to be seen whether these political positions will make or break the primary chances of the 2024 field, but there is no doubt that this war is ushering a new chapter in the Republican race. Welcome back. An update on the Alaska Airline pilot's attempted murder now. The off-duty pilot charged with trying to disable the engines of an Alaska Airlines jet in flight told police afterwards that he was suffering a nervous breakdown and he had taken psychedelic mushrooms two days earlier and had not slept in 40 hours. Court documents say an off-duty pilot who tried to cut the engine power of an Air Alaska jet mid-flight over the weekend had taken psychedelic mushrooms two days before boarding and hadn't slept for 40 hours. That pilot, Joseph David Emerson, appeared in Oregon State Court for the first time on Tuesday. He pleaded not guilty to state charges through his attorney. They included 83 counts of attempted murder, one for every crew member and passenger on the plane besides himself, and a single count of endangering the aircraft, which was bound for San Francisco Sunday before it was diverted to Portland, Oregon. The flight crew told investigators that Emerson, who was sitting in a jump seat in the cockpit, tried to grab the fire suppression handles and that he came close to shutting down hydraulic operation and fuel to both engines of the plane and was seconds away from turning it into a glider. Federal prosecutors said that after the cockpit incident, Emerson in wrist restraints tried to grab the handle of an emergency exit during the flight's descent but was stopped by a flight attendant. A court document later said Emerson told police he'd been depressed for the past six months. He'd taken magic mushrooms for the first time and believed he was having a nervous breakdown. Medical research has shown that psilocybin, a naturally occurring hallucinogen found in certain mushroom varieties, commonly called magic mushrooms, to be beneficial as a treatment for anxiety, depression, and other mental disorders. Oregon is the first U.S. state to decriminalize psilocybin. Since 2020, it has legalized supervised therapeutic use for adults at least 21 years old, 
However, psilocybin remains strictly prohibited under federal law. Updates on the conflict in Ukraine now. The Ukrainian military is training new recruits and wounded troops who have been rehabilitated in northern Ukraine, hundreds of miles from the front. Ukrainian soldiers are engaged in a bitter battle with Russian forces in the east since the war broke out in February 2022. <laughs> Explosives clearance training in a northern Ukrainian forest, hundreds of miles from the front. <laughs> Some of these men are new recruits, others were recently fighting in the east. We've temporarily left the combat zone and we're reconstituting our units, bringing in new people. There are also a lot of guys who were wounded, have been through rehabilitation and are now back in the ranks. He too walks with a slight limp. I got hit in the leg by shrapnel from an RPG or something, but thank God I'm OK. And sometimes I feel even more motivated than before to finish the job. Babai's injury was sustained in an industrial area on the edge of Luhansk region, a landscape not unlike these abandoned buildings near the camp. The troops practice storming and defending them using paintball. Game over. Something went a bit wrong with communication within the team. The ammunition let us down too. In real life, I've never stormed a building like that. I've done other things. But that's why we're training, to be ready for everything. Training is also taking place inside the tents. These unit commanders are studying how to capture a village, applying both NATO doctrine and experience. The civilian factor, quite right. So, what civilian factors do we take into account? The media and the local population, those are the main things. In the tent next door, there's a touchscreen map of the area where part of the brigade is still fighting. We keep track of the changes, where our units have moved forward, what positions our units have forced the occupier out of. In fact, despite fierce fighting, the line of contact in those Luhansk-Donetsk borderlands hasn't moved much. These men, updating their rosters, may soon be heading back to the same area. A woman tonight is fighting for life after a serious crash with a police car at Victor Harbour in South Australia. The impact caused the cage car to roll several times with two senior constables inside also taken to hospital. A Ford Laser meters from a couple's home and a police cage car torn apart from flipping several times on impact. One car through a front fence. We do have one trapped. It looks like a so-called vehicle has been involved as well. Emergency crews called to the Seaview Road and Carlisle Street intersection at 1.30 this morning. The driver of the Ford needing to be cut from the wreckage. It was loud. That's all I can say. It was really loud. The 48-year-old driver rushed to the Flinders Medical Centre with life-threatening injuries. Her passenger escaping unharmed. Two senior constables were treated in the local hospital but have since been released. It was a collision that wasn't part of a pursuit or any other operational matter. The sight of the crumpled back half of the cage car, a shock to locals who say it's lucky no one was inside. Well, that could have possibly been broken bones or even death, who knows? you really got to watch when we go down here, you've got to look left, right, left, right, because um, sometimes we've got a car uh, parked on the close to the court, it's very hard to see. Next in Liberia, the country's electoral commission scheduled a presidential election runoff for November 14th after results showed that the two frontrunners, President George Weir and opposition leader Joseph Boakai, had failed to secure enough votes. Liberia's presidential election is headed to a runoff vote in November. That's according to the country's electoral commission. Neither President George Weir nor opposition leader Joseph Boakai got enough votes to win outright. According to tallied results, Wea holds a slim lead with 43.83% of the vote, but less than half of a percentage point separates the two candidates. The commission added there was a record turnout of nearly 79% of around 2.4 million registered voters. The October election was widely seen as a test of support for former soccer star Wea. He's been criticized for not doing enough to tackle corruption in his first term. On the campaign trail, he promised to rebuild the country's economy, institutions and infrastructure. 
Boakai campaigned on what he described as the need to rescue Liberia from alleged mismanagement by WIA's administration. The runoff vote will take place on November 14th. Welcome back. In Russia, the Kremlin dismisses Putin's heart attack rumors. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world. The Kremlin dismissed rumors that Russian President Vladimir Putin has suffered a cardiac arrest. Russian authorities released pictures apparently taken on the same day showing Putin and Deputy Prime Minister Denis Mantrov in a meeting. China officially dismissed its Defense Minister Li Shangfu, who disappeared from public view after China-Africa Peace and Security Forum about two months ago. Since South Korea's first reports of lumpy skin disease, a viral infection affecting the cattle, the confirmed number of cases has risen to 27 so far across the country. And the nation's Prime Minister vows to take action in early stages. Carnival Corps Australian unit has ordered to pay the medical expenses of a woman who contracted COVID-19 with the judge ruling on October 25th and the cruise ship operator misled passengers about safety risks in a landmark class action ruling. Scientists from Peru and Poland unveiled the face of a girl sacrificed more than 500 years ago in the Inca Empire and her mummified remains were found near a volcano in the Peruvian Andes nearly three decades ago. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you have missed any of today's programs, you can always rewatch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other than English. We are leaving you tonight in Mexico City as Mexicans painted and got dressed up as the iconic Mexican skeleton La Catrina for pre-Day of the Dead celebrations. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.